when we talk about digital transformation, it comes in many forms, and a lot of people think it's something that you can go hire one of the big five consultancies, or any consultancy for that matter, maybe some of you in the room do this work, and say that I'm going to take you through transformation, we're going to transform your business. It'll take six months, 12 months, it'll take $10 million, and you'll be transformed. Bullshit. It actually, it's happening really quick, and, and it's a combination of things that are happening right now. It is information that is bad. There's bad data and there's disinformation. Disinformation is the stuff that causes riots in the stock market to go crazy and Twitter to get in all kinds of trouble. But bad data is what most of us have in our organizations and those of you who are agents and most of your clients have bad data in some form or fashion. There's a convergence of things that are happening on the operations and logistics standpoint that was accelerated by the pandemic because we all got curbside delivery and things delivered to our house. And we don't want to wait in line. We don't want to have to wait in line and visit the store as much as we used to. I already talked a little bit around the technology evolution, bots and automation. Uh, there are about 150 different bots out there right now. Artificial intelligence, it can help you write a blog post in about 30 seconds because all you gotta do is give it an outline and then it writes it for you. Many, many, many. Uh, follow Mike Kaput, K-A-P-U-T, on LinkedIn. He's with the Marketing Art Artificial Intelligence Institute. Uh, they've got a great conference, MyCon, coming up in August. Uh, Globalization of stakeholders and public policy making. We're going to talk a little bit about that today, and then blockchain, of course, that is the end game. So, blockchain, I'm not up here to explain to you what blockchain is because most of you are probably thinking about blockchain as something like Bitcoin. You're thinking about it as Ethereum, Shiba Inu. Any Shiba Inu owners in the room? Me? I get 2 million coins. I'm waiting. I'm just waiting for the day. I just need 0.2%. To start to happen there. I'm not talking about cryptocurrency. I'm talking about the distributed ledger and the integrity of information that's happening right now. What Whole Foods and Walmart use to track a banana from the tree to your table to let you know why you have salmonella, where it came from, and who touched it, right? They can get right down to the exact point in the supply chain thanks to blockchain. There's a number of things that are happening in that world, and this is where we're headed. And what's fascinating is most people, if you follow people on Twitter, there's a lot of hoorah about the fact that blockchain is going to have us all on the internet instead of Google, right? That's what we're led to believe. Bullshit again. As the who said, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. That's what's going on right now. We'll talk about that. The thing I need to have everybody understand is even with Web3, we're still on Web2 technology. You still need an email address and a password to use your wallet. You still need an email and an and, and a, a email address and a password to access whatever it is that you're using to manage your cryptocurrency or your wallet or whatever else. So it's the same data we've been working with for over 10 years that's going to dictate how we move into this Web3. And really, the thing that you need to watch right now is all the privacy moves that both companies and governments are saying are about privacy. So a real quick look at things like the California Consumer Privacy Act. We have five states, I'll get to a map here in a second, that have already passed legislation, but these laws, all based on GDPR, if you remember that about four years ago when GDPR went into force, it got passed before that, but in Europe, the global data privacy regulations as they went into force. These are the big things that it gave customers the right to do. Uh, it actually started in Scandinavia where people in Sweden could commit digital suicide. They could call a company and say, I want you to delete right now everything you know about me. How many of you could do that today? You can, you know, we collectively can barely unsubscribe somebody the minute they ask us to do it. This is, this is what this is called. The right to see all of the data that the company has on you, the individual. Further, the right to request you to pause for me to tell you, don't send me any more catalogs, don't send me any more emails, do not target me with display advertising. Stop it now. 
The right to immediate rectification of errors. Let me get in there and find out what's right and what's wrong, what needs to be corrected with my data. The right to an immediate notification of a breach. These are separate laws usually. These exist in Illinois, they exist in the state of Texas. They exist all over the country right now. That if data is breached, you have to notify everybody who, could, who may have been affected, usually within 30 days or a shorter amount of time. Laws are written different state by state. And the right to port their data, just like you can move from Verizon to AT&T, you can move from McDonald's to Wendy's. That's the future. That's what these laws said. I want to take everything that McDonald's has on me, and I want to take it over to Wendy, and I want her to be able to use it against me. So I tell her to pause it, or I tell her to delete it. And then, of course, as I said, the right to full deletion. As I said before, this all started with GDPR in Europe. Then I went to the California Consumer Privacy Act here in North America. But the thing we're going to talk about today is these laws are a recipe to get your act together, to get your data together, or your client's data together, to clean it up. And the, the easiest thing I can say for those in the room that can remember it, dating myself here, but in the 1980s, the United States government started to solicit the technology and the broadcast industries to find a different spectrum of broadcast. And there was a moment in the late 90s that all of a sudden we took our cathode ray tube televisions and we threw them out the window, almost literally, and we all got these flat televisions. Some of you may have grandparents that still have a CRT television in their houses, a bigger TV, a thicker TV, a heavier TV, and a much worse picture on that TV. This is the same thing governments are saying right now. They're telling companies, stop spamming, stop making so much noise on the internet, get your stuff together, and better yet, get ready for blockchain. You can't go to blockchain if your data is a mess. You just can't do it. Here's the state of things as of May 19, uh, in terms of deal flow, we'll call it. Uh, you've got bills in committee, you have bills that have been passed, you have laws that are all over the place. This is a North American problem. There are many things, especially what we've seen happen in the state of Texas this week. There are just things that America has as problems nobody else has. Sometime over the next two years, there will be a federal law that's passed that's one law to govern us all in terms of data privacy. It's not coming tomorrow, but it'll happen. In the meantime, you're going to have to know when you have so many customers in Colorado, they have rights, even though you're in Texas, and you've got to do what they're asking you to do. So the five things we're going to talk about, and my talk used to be really just about the blessings that come from this, are going to be how to build golden customer records for every person that you serve. The longer you've been in business, the dirtier your data is. There's a way to fix that. That's what we're going to talk about today and building a true north of insights on your customers. That's going to allow you to have stronger segmentation of your audience. It's going to allow you to do things that will be real-time customer journey mapping, not journey mapping and 10 personas, but seeing the thousands of archetypes that you serve. It's also going to be streamlined operations. Once you dedupe your address book, you will be able to spend 20 to 30 percent less on media because you're going to eliminate all the waste. And then, lastly, it's good stuff in, good stuff out for machines. You're going to be able to use artificial intelligence and machine learning in ways that you never could before. Machines love structured data. Machines love and want to marry clean and structured data. So that's what we're talking about here. So what am I talking about with dirty data? You have customers. They've been with you for a long time. Uh, how many of you own more than one iPhone in the last two years? Okay. A good, a good half of you, probably. As you switch those iPhones, they have different ad identifiers on them, different Mac address, same email address, maybe same credit card, maybe you have a credit card get stolen, maybe you switch banks, you have different payment methods, you have different email addresses, you have uh, if anybody lives in Austin like I do, got Google Fiber now. That's a whole different IP address than what I had for 16 years with Grande Communications, right? 
all of a sudden I show up as a different person to people on the other end of the line. And what this does is it shows that the same person from all these different ways that are being tracked have all these different identities within the organization. And what you're going to do here is you're going to say, no, it's just Cliff. It's one person. And that's what, that's what machine learning is going to enable you to do. And you do that with a customer data platform. How many of you in the room, this is my, well, including the pandemic, this is my fifth year to be on a Digimark on stage, and I always ask this question. Five years ago, nobody did. How many of you have a CDP in place today, or your client has a CDP in place to, and are sharing data with you from it? One. Anybody? Okay. True customer data platforms. There are many ways to go about instant resolution, deduping all the data that exists across the organization. It's systems integration. It's being able to plug everything that has customer information into it into one system, one data link. Probably the bigger you are, the older you are, meaning the older the organization is, the more robust the operation is, the more frequent the transactions are, you're going to need a multi-cloud strategy to go behind that. But a customer data platform, the reason these are important right now is because of the digitization of everything. I mentioned it earlier, we have the Internet of Things, we have smart watches, we have smart toasters and fridges and cars, and we connect our phones to our cars, which means that if you drive a BMW, you drive a Volvo, you drive a GM product, all of your heart signals that are coming from your watch that are going to your phone are also going through to a satellite to somebody on the other end at General Motors or Volvo or BMW. Bottom line is, not to be freaky, is that true CDPs will be bring in 100% of the customer information, customer related information in the organization into that data link. And how do you do this? And how do you, before you do that, is you have to get consent from all of your customers to do this with their data. You have to do this period today. Doesn't matter if you have laws in your state or not that hold you to some higher level of privacy regulation or privacy compliance, but you'll need to be able to ask customers for consent. And these are the things that you have right now on your home pages that say, hey, we, we ask you to accept cookies. Would you like to see the cookies? Would you like to see the necessary cookies, the performance cookies, the advertising cookies, right? That's easy button, but the bigger part of that is what Apple has done here, purportedly so you can do all the things that I prescribed that, that data privacy laws make you do, ability for you to go in with your Apple ID and password and do all the things that I said earlier. Look at your data, correct your data, see what they have on you, ask them to stop using it, prohibit them from selling it to anybody, or deleting it, right? Apple does this right now. The URLs on the bottom for anybody who's got iPads and phones, you want to go play with that. It's pretty fascinating. It's not a whole lot different than Facebook when they got in trouble with Cambridge Analytica and they just all of a sudden gave us a you know, nice little website for us to go look at everything Facebook had on us, allowed us to delete or maybe to pull down everything that they had on us. You guys remember that from about five years ago. So when you prepare to build a customer data platform and you're shopping for a customer data platform, there's things that you need to do in the organization first. You'll need to meet with people, anyone who's in a customer facing or a customer related position. You'll need to tell them that you're about to do this. You need to do this because they need to be able to document all the data that they have, the systems that they're using, the CD-ROMs that they have in the filing cabinet, anything that, that they have data on. You're going to want to know about it. And you're going to want to socialize this with everybody because everybody's going to want to have access to it once you've done it. You'll need to build a data dictionary, a way that the organization themselves talk about data, protocols, privilege access management. Not everybody has, it's not going to be everybody's opportunity to just go into this massive database and query it the way they want to. Set rules. You're going to want to locate and identify all the PII, 
identifiable and personal, personal identifiable information that exists in the organization. And you're going to want to pull that out to the side. Sometimes that's email addresses, a whole lot of times it's cell phone numbers, social security numbers, credit scores, home, home addresses, the really personal stuff, birthdays, that stuff. You're going to want to pull it over to the side. We're going to put it back in. We just need to pull it over to the side at first. We need to know that we have it. We need to catalog that we have that information. Then we need to map all the data sources. This is, again, if we've talked to everybody, they're giving us API documentation. It's as easy as calling Marketo, Salesforce, uh, Infusionsoft. Uh, if you work for a bank, calling Jack Henry or Oracle, who owns Jack Henry, credit unions, Simitar. Call them up and say, I need API documentation. Bring that to the table and we'll understand how we're going to connect everything to this data lake, the CDP. And then, as a part of that dictionary, we talked about establishing a tax taxonomy and the way you'll tag data coming in. Because you'll want to know where the data came from as it goes into the data lake. If you're following me here. This is usually where I lose people. But as you tag it as it comes in, you'll want to be able to go back and search it, right? All the people that came from this system or that system, everyone who's using the Samsung Galaxy versus an iPhone, as those two companies change the rules on how you can and cannot get data or things don't resolve on their, on their screens. And then the last order of business is to prioritize the sequence of how you want to plug each API into the data layer and start the process of ETL, you know, transforming the data as it goes in. This is another way to look at it. The CDP is going to have everything connected to it. This is still elementaryized. That's not even a word, but I'm going to use it. This is still simplified for what happens. Some of my clients have got two to three hundred different systems that we're all plugging in to the CDP. The second thing we do on the far left there is right now, while it's legal, because I don't think this is going to last too long, there are about 20 companies in the country right now that are data brokers. They have identity graphs. And what they can do is they can, with that identity graph, match it to what's in the CDP and then enrich all the data that you have. And they can do some pretty scary stuff. They can, they're the ones that have your credit scores and the magazines you subscribe to, where you go to church, how do you identify sexually, all those things. That's all public information. You've let it be public, it's out there. These folks can come in and they can enrich that, that data. Notice I said, while you can, I don't think that's gonna last too long. That's the, that's the really scary stuff because there's only 20 companies that are doing it in a big, big way, I won't mention their names. I think they'll be regulated pretty soon. Ultimately, what this will do is this will put you in a fantastic opportunity, a fantastic position to employ more marketing automation at scale, not just marketing automation in terms of email and email testing, but the things you want to do with programmatic media. That's the other side of this is programmatic media has been built for about seven years for this kind of thing, personalization at scale. If you are able to put all that data into one place, have those golden records, and then do better segmentation, now, some of the things you just heard about, we can start to customize and personalize the marketing experience at scale to the things that Tim sees, only Tim sees. I mean that. Millions of customers and the configuration of media, message, design, video or not, whatever it might be, being personalized. DSPs will love this. This is where demand side platforms are expecting you not just to take something out of the CRM and send it to them or from Facebook or somewhere else. They're looking for the companies that have gone through this process and have resolved the entity, have got one record for everybody that's in there and can say, hey, we have every one of you guys four trucks that identifies as Catholic and also shops at HEB and has a degree from Harvard. We want all those folks to see this app. That kind of thing. 
I already mentioned it, it reduces your waste in media spend in a big way because you're, you're deduping things. You're not shotgunning your message. You're not shotgunning what you're doing from an ad standpoint. It drastically improves, improves attribution, which has eluded marketers for a long time. What's working, what's not working, what's converting, what's not. It puts you in a situation where you can look at return on ad spend, right? And be able to quantify things like what is your cost per lead? It's no longer just that Google shows as the, as the originator of 52% of your traffic, right? You're actually able to look behind that a little bit and understand what was working, what wasn't. It, it's where you can do things with lead scoring. It enables the rapid adoption of new product lines because that data, um, as it was stated right before me, marketers, we know customers at the end of the day because of the data we have, we know it, we know those customers better than anybody else. And with that, marketers get a seat at the table for product development. And it puts you in a posi position to where you can start to move in more of a real-time fashion with your marketing. I won't narrate this slide to any, any amount really, but companies that have gone through this process they, if you'll if you're following me, they have everybody in the company plugged into the same system. Everybody in the company has a view of customer behavior, at least what they need to see. Go back to setting protocols and rules of who gets to see what. And with that, you're building empathy and scale to a certain degree. I don't believe that digital media alone can give you empathy with customers. but. Uh, certainly an opportunity to understand customer behavior in a way you never have before. Um, this is absolutely where it's headed in terms of the circuitous way that we operate, right? It's no longer just that people come in a funnel and they come out of it, they bought something, and we just try to put more people on the top of the funnel. It's now because everything's connected, we're actually able to see people after they've been a customer for a while, who are their neighbors? Who are their, who are folks that identify like them? What's the lookalike audience look like? Um, how long ago did they buy something and they bought something new and then who else looks like them, right? It's, it's a constant rinse and repeat of the information. I did say personalization and skill. Um, talked a little bit about lifetime value earlier. Um, you're able to customize your advertising and your corp cons beyond things that are like first name and last name and where you live. You're able to do things much deeper, much richer. Um, more meaningful customer care engagements and, and improved CX. Before you think about this in terms of just an outbound opportunity, if anybody here is in customer support or in there, they call themselves customer experience professionals who work in contact centers, they're the ones who need this data more than anybody else. Because how much of a pain in our tail is it when we call somebody because it was cold, or there was a fly in it, or there was a payment, if somebody used my bank account to do something that I didn't know about, and I have to wait on hold for five minutes, and then I get on there, and I have to remember exactly how I spelled where I went to elementary school, and then I have to give them the last four of my social number, and then they say, well, hold on, let me transfer you to somebody else, right? That is history. That's the way it used to be. So when I say, when I talk about CX, they're the ones, that's the market right now who wants this data more than anybody else. They want a heads up view when somebody calls in or when they refer from a chat bot into an agent, they want to say, oh, that's Bob. He bought that burger 15 minutes ago and he shops there twice a week. His lifetime value is three hundred and fifty-two dollars a month. I mean, we got we got to. Hey, Bob, you're pretty important. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, I talked a little bit about some of these things earlier, but uh, reducing and eliminating some of the errors that happen with humans when it comes to data entry. That's another thing that creates bad data across the organization very natural, it's not a knock on humans, it just happens. But as you're doing this and you're sharing data from that one single record, that one record that everybody knows is clear and clean and correct, 
as you're doing that. It helps eliminate a lot of those errors. Um, I talked a little bit about product development, but the fantastic stuff you can do with artificial intelligence and modeling the data. And this is machine learning, is what I'm talking about here, is being able to constantly have predictive and regressive models based on the audiences that you're most interested in, the audiences that you're ideating on, whatever the seasonal cultural thing is that's driving your marketing ideation. Now you have data you can dig in, you can see what worked last year, what worked last month, what were these people doing, how do they interact with us over the last six weeks, those kinds of things. It makes people happy, makes customers happy, that you care about them, that you know something about them, or at least that you're empathetic and reasonably knowing of who they are and caring of who they are. And then this from a security standpoint is much more secure than allowing that data just to be willy-nilly stored in 15 to 200 different places around the organization. So, uh, as, you, as you really think about how you want to leverage machine learning at scale, uh, it's really simple. Think about what it is you're trying to achieve. One of the easiest things that you can do is look at your calendar. Look at your calendar and look at the thing that you do three times a week. Look at the reports that you generate three times a month. If you do it three times a month, a machine can do it for you. If you do it three times a week, a machine can do it for you. Set goals and set priorities. Look at what it is that you're doing again and again and again. And if you've done it again and again and again, I promise you, the machines can do it for you. Remember, good data in, good data out. Clean and structured data is what we're talking about here. Uh, it usually takes about 90 days for what I would say are the top 10 CDPs on the market. You ready to tell me who they, you to tell you who they are? All right. Uh, and these are mostly, these are not all enterprise. So uh, Salesforce has been very active with Trailhead, right? Which is not one system, it's several systems working together to give you that true north. There's Salesforce with that. Oracle has Unity, which they're pushing out through their modern marketing messaging right now. If you use Eloqua, then somebody at Oracle is going to want to talk to you about Oracle Unity being the thing. That's their CDP. Treasure Data is one that we've worked with quite a, quite a few times. Treasure Data actually removes the schemas from data as they bring it in, meaning that data that comes in tagged with Samsung and Apple bits and, and your, your BMW and Volvo bits every time it comes in, they clean it out of there because that, you don't need that necessarily as it comes in. Uh, very clean in terms of what they do. Um, Mparticle is another one. Mparticle is one that I say scales all the way down to small and medium businesses. Um, they've got a great way of just looking. They actually have, go check it out, they have a, um, a, a way that you can do a, a point of uh, proof of concept, a free proof of concept with their system right now. And Particle is a fantastic one. Segment, uh, which was acquired by Twilio about three or four years ago, that's interesting because Twilio, uh, basically, they do fantastic things with text messaging and they know all of us because they have all of our information um, when it comes to that, which is happening on our, our cell phones. Um, I'm probably at five or six now. There's more. Ask me after I, I get off stage. Um, you know, the wonderful thing all this does is, as I said before, it's providing humans with fantastic guidance. And that's the beautiful thing about artificial intelligence. It's not going to take our jobs, necessarily. It may reassign us. It, but it allows us to do what humans will do way before computers or machines can do it, and that's to be creative and strategic and thoughtful about what we're doing from a marketing standpoint. So, if you've been watching, who watched the Google Live announcement yesterday? One table here, a couple more. So, Let's talk about this. Is my this is my meet the new boss, same as the old boss statement earlier, and these are all companies that are moving in a direction of blockchain. The first one's Apple. Last year, when Apple pushed out iOS 
14 and really quick on the heels of it, I was 14.5. What happened? Our dashboard went flat. A lot of our dashboards did. No longer, and it wasn't just the iPhone, right? It was Apple TV. It was when you turned on Apple TV, it had a little message sent up. Said, would you like ESPN to track you across all the other apps that you use? No. Right? No. And that's what Apple did first. And then when they pushed out iOS 15, what happened then? That's when all of our read signals on our newsletters went flat because if they were using Apple Mail, it was defaulted to not send read receipts, right? You guys remember this? This just happened last year, in the last year. Apple is also in just about every major OEM making cars today with CarPlay. They have their own operating system for cars, meaning the onboard system, ODB2, ODB3 is where we're going now, uh, probably beyond that. but. This means the operating system for the vehicle itself, not just the entertainment. Apple is there. Who's right there with them? Amazon. Uh, I didn't mention, I mentioned Apple TV, but I didn't mention Apple Home. I didn't mention Apple Watch. I didn't, you know, I didn't mention a couple other things. They've got us, they've got us surrounded, right? Amazon, same thing. Amazon went out the gate did two things, right? They listen to everything we say in our house, whether she's in there on, a, on an Echo dot or not, she's on your phone and she's listening to everything that you do. And they've come out and they've said it's the only data that we'll never get rid of. It's the only data that we're going to continuously learn from. And I'll, if I have time, I might have been here. I'll tell you some other scary stuff that they've done. But the other thing, what do they do is they acquire a ring. Anybody notice about a year and a half ago, if you had a ring on your house, all of a sudden, when Amazon did the deal with the post office to run on Sundays and deliver Amazon packages on Sundays, all of a sudden the ring would no longer pick up the post office, the, the postal worker coming to your door. Anybody notice that? Yeah. It's, it, it's real, They're, what they do. And I asked my postal worker, I said, how did that happen? And he just said, well, two weeks ago, we got a new scanner to scan packages when we, we drop them off. I don't know what this thing does, but I think I know what it does. Bottom line is, in that case, all Amazon's trying to do is cover their ass. They throw boxes around just like FedEx did a few years ago, and everybody was catching, catching smartphone images in New York, of the FedEx guys throwing boxes around. Amazon's just like, if we drop a box on the way to the door, we don't need anybody to see it, right? But they see everybody else that comes to the door, and of course, they're listening to everything that happens in our house. Google, again, in my neighborhood in Austin, Texas, about a year and a half ago, they came through and they dug up a two inch wide ditch along the street, up and down miles of neighborhood. And three months later, the direct mail started. Google Fiber is here. It's here. But Google, who owns Nest, is already in our houses as well. Cameras, sensors, thermostats. And for you, you bought a new refrigerator in the last year, probably in your refrigerator. Alexa's in there too. Um, Google, of course, is on all of our phones. And Google has been right there with Apple, step for step, in our cars as well. Samsung. Samsung, largest install base of connected televisions in the world. More people have a Samsung connected television on their wall than anybody else. And what's the first thing you do when you turn that television on? Pair a phone with it, right? Be on the same Wi-Fi, use this phone, and now you can use it as a remote or record stuff. So now Amazon, all of these companies have done something in the last three years. Google is already doing, but Google just yesterday, as part of Google Live, the majority of their announcements were advertising products, correct? 
the majority of what they announce were advertising products. Apple, just look at what their advertising revenue has been since iOS 14.5 launched and iOS 15 launched. It's no longer going to the trade desk, it's actually going to Apple directly to reach Apple users, paying Apple to reach Apple users. Amazon, same thing, right? Amazon, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, just did to Google what Google says they're gonna to do to everybody next year, which is do a cookie, right? We're still gonna have ways to target people. We're still gonna be able to find people and target customers, no doubt about it. But Amazon, three weeks ago, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but Amazon made the decision that Google could no longer track Amazon users in the Amazon ecosystem, in and out of it. And that throws Amazon for a loop because when you leave Amazon and go to Facebook, they can't put that sweater in front of you anymore or that can of Chef Boyardee, whatever it was you were looking at. Questions? Stick, on, stick with the CDP questions for sure. Uh, but this is what I mean, guys. This is, this is the most fascinating time of our lives as marketers. And my point with customer data platforms is now is the time to connect peer-to-peer -peer with customers. Now is the time. I didn't mention a certain company. They were not out most more logos over there, right? But there's, we have for the last 10 to 15 years, we have seen 25 to 75% of our budgets go out to two or three companies to reach people. And that entire time, all but three of those years, everybody's been carrying a phone that you can get right to with text messages, with email, with phone calls, direct, peer to peer to them. But we pay somebody, the middleman, and those middlemen are all doing what they're doing. I gave you the preliminary recipe, or the prescription at least, on what you can do to take control of data and start to capitalize on that interpersonal, personalized relationship. Somebody want to grab the fuzzy cube and ask me a question? Thanks for the talk. That was, uh, and I agree with you uh, on the uh, the CDB uh, perspective. But you know what you just mentioned, as far as you know, everybody has a device, and we can communicate with them if they're a current customer. We have data about them, and you brought up the topic of in the future. You know, we'll, we're looking at this cookie list environment. What do you see, or how how do you think it will change? If they're not our customer, we don't have them in our our current database. How do we model and target them with marketing in the future? Right. Well, I mean, um, for the customers that you do have, and this is a this is a general, not knowing your your situation. I mean, you're starting off first, right? Right. Um, I highly advise not buying. Don't buy lists. You know, there's mm -hmm. if if any of you are active on LinkedIn. Everybody's using automated LinkedIn invitations telling you right now we'll come in and do appointment setting for you, right? And lead gen for you. If that's your business, I'm sorry. It's a crap business, but uh, uh, it's, it's sleazy, right? It's just, it, it is. Uh, but you know, for folks that do have the, some semblance of knowing who their customer is, this is where you can start to do some just general analysis of folks. Just find out a few more things about them. The people that are buying from you, send a survey out to them. Ask them a few more questions, directional questions, right? Ask them directional questions on how often will you buy one. Not net promoter score, we can tell your friends about us, but you know, do you think you'll buy another one of these from us? Or when's your birthday? Or whatever else, you know? What's your zip code? Is another one, you know? And then you can start to model things that give you a, a, a direction and more focus, and those that have more data are able to do this and build lookalike audiences. And this is where DSPs, the demand side platforms, right. actually, they're the ones that can today, you just say, I think we're looking for people that do X, Y, Z, and A. Yeah, right. And they'll which, say, oh, well, let's dial that up for you. Which makes sense, but you know, in, let's say, three years from now, will they even have the data that even if you've modeled this audience for them, yeah. and you say, okay, go get, people who look like this, 
will they be able to do that, you know, in three years from now? Well, um, I mentioned the trade desk earlier. I mean, the trade desk to me is the, is the 800 pound gorilla yep. when it comes to the ESPs. Um, you know, there are things that Axiom and uh, there's a few others that I think ran into problems just two years ago because they were building their lists basically on IP addresses. Mm-hmm. And that can't do that anymore. Right. You just have, that's gone. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, Trade Desk is made, it, it, they have a great blog showing the things that they've been done, doing the competition they've been having with all the brands that I just showed. They're having coming up with agreements, right? Right. So if you want to reach out to the users, they've got an agreement with Apple to, to do this. It might cost you, but you know, yeah. there, there, there's that. I mean, I just still think, um, I think if you're starting something today, the best, the I tell anybody who's starting a company, get ready to write a hundred personal emails a day, <laughs> right? Yeah. Just yeah. get ready to knock on doors, but make sure you have a CRM at least right now, where right. all that information is in a spot and your little hidden BCC code is populating the records for you as you're doing that. You're gonna yeah. graduate out of that at some point. Yeah growth um, but to your three-year thing um, like I said there's still going to be ways to find people and there's still there's still ways I mean, it, would, it would it would it would throttle the advertising industry to its knees which I think is going to happen anyway the bigger they are the harder they're going to fall um, I think that's that's the next three to five years right I think yeah. the whole idea of advertising is going to is going to change drastically um, but I, I think uh, I think you'll still have ways to identify people